Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to React 4. So this is advanced, advanced React. So this is all like other kind of tools that a lot of front end developers use. So anytime you like sit in like a team meeting and discuss a lot of the architecture behind what kind of tools to use, what kind of frameworks or new languages, a lot of the times you'll see a lot of these kind of um, tools being brought up. So because there's so many of them, like technology is always evolving. Um, there's always new and new things being implemented. Um, we can't go like super in deep to every single of these um, tools. So we're going to give like a really high level overview of all of these um, languages. But for sure, like I think knowing these, like these are brought up on every single like team meeting. And, and so I think it's very, very important for um, front end people to know how to use these tools or at least what these tools are used for. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and just begin to go down the notion because I think the notion is a pretty good description. Um, um, anytime you wanna just like have a good overview, just look at the notion. Um, yeah, so we're gonna first talk about um, Axios. So Axios, I think as like a kind of pre before that, um, I, I was wondering, did you guys learn about use effect yet? Could you give me like a yes or no in the chat? Because I think use effect might be super important to learn even before Axios. Does it ring any bells, use effect? Okay, one no. All right, that means I gotta explain it. Okay, so if it's like not clear, don't worry. I can go over it because I think we might have some time today. So I'm gonna go over use effect before Axios because they're kind of interrelated. So I got like a really quick example that I found online. Let's see if I can pull that up really quick. So I'm on Code Sandbox right now. Anytime you guys want to do something on your browser and you don't want to create a new React app every time, I suggest using Code Sandbox. It's a very, very good, um, uh, just everything's within your, your browser so you don't have to make it on your local machine. So um, here we have one example of use effect. So you guys already learned use state. Um, so hopefully I don't have to re-explain that. Um, so yeah, let's look at one of the use cases for use effect. So basically what use effect does is every time it renders, it's going to make this, whatever you put inside your use effect function happen. So it kind of depends on what, when, it really, really depends on what kind of thing you're trying to do. But in this specific case, this is like form validation. So let's try to make um, like a form. We already kind of have all the code here. Every time it's over five letters, it will say valid input, but if it's less than five letters or characters, it will say input not valid. So this is very, very common in a lot of form validations. A lot of the times they don't let like space bars or like some weird like asterisk question marks kind of characters. So this is how people do like the form validation for this kind of stuff. So use effect, if we look into here, um, we can see if the input so we have a state here, which is input. So input is basically changing every time um, a person types something, it's gonna go into input handler and uh, set the input to be whatever that person changed it to. So that's what input is. It's gonna check the input length. And if it's less than five, we're going to set is valid to false. And if it's uh, more than five, it's gonna say true. And depending on that, it's gonna say, oh, it's not valid and it is valid. Um, the rest of it, you guys already know, so I'm not gonna go too um, deep into it. But the main part is use effect. So another key important thing to know is that we have a second parameter called a dependency array. So the dependency array is kind of like whenever, whatever you put inside of the dependency array is changed. So if the state of it is changed, um, it's going to render use effect. So if you don't want it to render during some times, um, then you would put like, for example, an empty bracket. An empty bracket never changes, right? It's, it's just an empty bracket. So this means that 
um, this use effect will only run once at the start of your app. But if, for example, you want it to run every time the input changes, then you'd put input in here because whenever input changes, you want to validate it, right? Check it to see if the length has changed and depending on that, um, whether to set is valid to true or false. So it kind of depends on whatever you want to check here. Um, you can also not have any dependency array at all. So if you do this, this means every single time it renders, it's going to call use effect. Um, so just the, as a reminder, rendering, anytime state is changed, um, React is gonna re-render. That's just the way React works and it's a key, key part um, to React. So I have a question that says, can we put several variables in the bracket? Yeah, you can put several variables. So anytime any of whatever variables, you can put blah, blah, blah. Whenever those two, anytime they change, um, use effect will be called. Yeah, so I think that's a pretty brief uh, intro to use effect. I don't think there's anything else I have to mention here, but if you have any questions, I can feel free, uh, yeah, feel free to ask and I can answer. Yeah, so if, if it's in brackets, it doesn't mean they all have to change. It just means if any of them change, then use effect is gonna be called. Yeah, no problem. And just more about the syntax. I don't wanna go too much into the syntax because you can actually search all of it online, but um, it's a function. So you can go ahead and call like an arrow function here. And this is the most standard way to write it. Yeah, okay. So now that I explained the use effect, um, I am going to, let's see. I do wanna really, really briefly mention, go back to this example code that I showed at um, one of the first, I believe, or second React lectures, I forgot. Um, in React, are arrow functions always used? Um, got that question. Um, so you don't have to always use an arrow function. Arrow functions are from JavaScript, right? So it's basically, you, you don't have to use it, but personally, like it's like, this is like, like a very modern way to do it. And I don't like to see the word function. It's like very long. I don't think a lot of people like to write that many characters too. So I think arrow functions are, are very, very standard practice. Um, but if not, you can always write a function inside it too. All right. Oh um, yeah, what was I saying again? Okay, so here is an example I showed a long time ago when we were learning about state. And I kind of just really briefly went through use effect here and didn't really explain it too well. So just to go back to it, hopefully it makes more sense now. So every time count is changed, we want to fetch from the API. Another really, really key part of use effect is that a lot of the times it's used for calling from, a, uh, from an API. Every time you have a link given to you by backend or some sort of database website, um, you want to update whatever is on your screen um, to reflect whatever happened in the database, right? So use effect is very, very important for that. So in this case, we can say every time count is changed, we're gonna fetch from this API link and do whatever it, uh, we want from it. So just as a review of fetch, um, I'm not sure if we've gone over it before, but we're gonna talk about Axios, which is a lot more easier way to do it and a lot more um, compatible to browsers, but as like the default way, um, so the way that originally comes with um, your browser is called fetch. So fetch is gonna call, take a URL. It's gonna do dot then. Dot then is what you do on promises. So whenever you want to um, settle a promise, use dot then. Then you take the response and change that into a JSON. So originally, your, if you were to do like console.log fetch this, this would print you out an object. It wouldn't print you out the actual data that you want. So we have to convert that to a JSON first. Um, and with this JSON, you also get another promise back. So when you get this promise back, you wanna change re response and actually set that to um, set fact. So it's a little bit complicated, which is why we don't like to use fetch. Um, but basically this is like, a very standard way to do it. Like it would first have like one dot then, which should do response, change the response to a JSON, then another dot then, and then um, whatever you wanna do is settled within that second dot then. And then we have a dot catch. Um, a dot catch is basically 
uh, whenever there's an error that's found, um, it's going to settle it however you want it to. So sometimes it shows an error message, sometimes it shows like a, uh, just the console.log, whatever you want it to show. So this might be a basic question, but what was a promise again? So a promise is basically something, it's basically making a promise to resolve um, something later. Like, some, uh, like if you were to um, fulfill this, it's saying that um, you want to fulfill this and come back to it later. Um, so basically the reason why you need to do promises is, is um, so that everything doesn't go at once. If everything were to render at once, um, it would be like super confusing for the browser, right? Um, you sometimes you need, sometimes another function relies on a previous function. So that's why promises come in place. It's saying fulfill, complete this thing and then go back to the other thing. So that's kind of what a promise is, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, if that's a little, it's a little confusing to explain promises. So if that doesn't like um, answer your question, I can also like try to answer it more um, at the end of the lecture. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see, what else should I go to? Okay, I think, so now we are ready to talk about Axios. So Axios is basically fetch, but a new library to do it in which it's a lot more easier. Um, so let's look at the notion. So it says, Axios is basically also another promise-based HTTP client. Um, it's how we connect the front end to the back end. Um, it's a very commonly used library. And I think the reason why it's preferred over to fetch is because it's a lot easier to manage. It works for a lot of browsers such as um, Internet Explorer. So um, fetch actually oddly doesn't work on like some browsers like Internet Explorer. So that's kind of um, kind of an issue. So Axios works on any browser. Axios also, uh, it's a little bit more like harder to explain, but um, it, it's a lot more easier to alter things. So if you want, if you want to like change headers, um, change anything within your um, data, um, database directly, Axios makes that a lot more easier. So let's see. So I'm sure you guys learned about get and post requests. If not, it's not like that important. Most of the time you would um, be using a get. But if you need a review, um, just go ahead and read over this. Uh, basically like a get a method um, requests a representation of um, kind of like retrieving the data. So whenever you want to retrieve data, you use get. So in this case, like if we want to retrieve something from an API, we would have to use get. Uh, yeah, let's see. So here's like one example. I'm not going to go too much into it because I think you can read it on your own. Uh, but let's see. Okay, yeah, I think the notion, I'll let you guys read on your own. Um, but let's see if we can find uh, an example that I wrote up earlier, if it will load. And we can kind of go through this example uh, to see one use case of Axios. So basically with this app here, we want um, every time we click on get next name to show the next um, user. All we know is that we're given an API that is this link. Um, okay, so another thing that I want to add is um, a lot of the times API links depend on a certain ID. So for example, if you have a ton of users, how are you gonna identify those users? You're gonna identify them by a certain ID, right? So a lot of the times your API link would have an ID equal something, a page equal something, that's a very, very common pattern within a lot of API links. So in order to actually feed it to grab the specific ID you want from that link, we can use, um, we can convert, in order to like put like logic within a string, 
uh, you can put um, these, I forgot what they're called, but I think some sort of ticks. Um, it's not the, just near your escape button. It's not the same thing as quotes, by the way. Once you wrap it in that, you can put a dollar sign and then curly brackets. And this is gonna be the same thing as just your regular old bracket. Um, so the reason why you do this is if you want to actually put logic within a string. So in this case, we want to put in a specific number into our API. Uh, let's take a look at the bigger picture though. Uh, let's see. So let me first walk you through the code, uh, the actual um, kind of sort of HTML element of it to hopefully um, just show you the code a little bit more thoroughly. So on our return, we have our variable user info. So this is going to store all user infos, right? And a lot of the times you'd be mapping something in, in um, React because um, as you can see, these are all like the same thing basically, right? And there's just a ton of them depending on how many you want to like show. Every time you click get next name, it's gonna show a new one, right? So because they are all um, the same kind of template, we want to use dot map. So we don't have to rewrite the code every single time. So we're gonna do user info and then we're gonna do dot map. That's gonna map info. Uh, so info, this could be whatever you want to call it. Um, you can call it literally anything. Um, and I is your index. We don't actually use indexing here, but it's standard practice to put an index um, within your map just so that in any case in which you have to use an index, um, it's just right there. So we have uh, just a display of the, the name and the first name and the last name. If you guys ever are wondering what an API is returning. Like, for example, you might be wondering, how did you know it's dot name? How'd you know it's like dot last or dot, dot first? You can always console.log and print that out, right? That's always one solution. Another solution, a lot of the times you can just copy and paste it. And you can see an actual JSON um, that you can read to see whatever info you need to take out of it. So it's actually really ugly. So a lot of the times what I do is just like search up like um, JSON formatter. And uh, that's just like a random tip if you can't read it because I don't appreciate ugly code. Um, yeah, it makes it a lot more easier to read. So for example, if we wanted like uh, the first name, we know that we have to do dot name dot first, um, just like our regular old JavaScript object. Okay, let's go back to here. So we did dot name dot first. Um, so far, do we have any questions? Okay, if not, I will continue. Okay, so we have a question. So the info here is each JSON line. Um, do you mean like which which info, like this info or um, the entire thing? Okay, so info here, uh, user info dot map. So it's not necessarily each JSON line. So user info is our array, right? We set it originally to an array and our user info is going to have uh, basically everything, all the users, right? But right now it initially starts with, with um, no users at all. And then we're going to basically increment it every single time to add like a new user every time you press get next name. Um, as you can see, I'll get to that later, but every time you press get next name, we're gonna have um, fetch new user be called, which I'll explain that function later. So with that, our array is gonna continue to grow fatter and fatter, right? It's gonna keep appending onto each other. Um, we can see like over here, this is where user info is being updated. So 
basically what info is, is taking each individual element from the fat user info array. So it's basically grabbing each individual user. So user info is actually not one specific user info, it's all of the users. And info is just one specific user. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so it's basically an element in an array that we fetch from the website. Yeah, that's like one way to think of it. It's basically, yeah, one specific element. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, let's see, where was I again? Okay, so same thing for image, um, very similar to this. Okay, so let's go on to one of the most important parts fetch new users. So we have a function that we're going to call every time get next name is clicked called fetch new user. And that is going to call get random user. And that's going to call like our page number, whatever the page number is currently at. So right now the page number is currently like one. Well, actually not right now because we clicked on it a couple of times, but uh, let me refresh. Okay, now it's currently at one. Okay, um, so once we call our page number, it's going to send the number into this function. And this function is going to get that specific user um, page. I think this specific API might not have been the best choice because this, this API actually returns um, a random user every single time. But a lot of the times your API will have very a specific user. So number one would always be cube or team and it wouldn't change. Um, but in our case, our API kind of changes it randomly every time. Um, okay. So after it calls, it's going to call um, a dot then, and that is going to change um, response to be response.data. So this is very similar to like the JSON kind of formatter. Um, basically, you're just changing it to become um, JSON so that we can actually um, not just look at the whole object, but look at a specific, um, look at the specific uh, responses data. So actually response, you might be wondering what it shows. Um, of course, you can just console.log out and print it, um, and print it out. But I'll just tell you guys, like response is like a lot of things. There's like, it's like it has a header in it. It has like, um, like a body, like a data. So there's so many things to uh, inside of it. But the only thing that we need is the data. So that's why we're gonna dot data it, and that's gonna automatically turn it into a JSON because like Axios does that without us having to do dot JSON, um, unlike um, fetch. Um, I guess another thing to mention is that you can actually use data uh, destructuring like any other part of React. So a lot of people will end up just doing this because um, people don't like writing a lot of code, I guess. So that's just one way to simplify uh, writing it. So got a question, what exactly is Axios? Is it like a library? Yeah, so Axios is a library. Um, it's basically just one of the developer's libraries to make life simpler. There's like a ton of tools out there that developers can use to help basically make things a lot easier than having to use the natural documentation. So the natural documentation would be fetch, but that one's like really hard to use and isn't like compatible for a lot of Website, so someone out there decided to create Axios in which we can download. So all of these, you'd have to download. Um, I'm not gonna go over the installation instructions, but if you just search like Axios um, how to download, it will show you like one command you have to type in into your terminal. And in that way you can install your library. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, let me know if there's any other questions as well. Okay, if not, I will continue. So we also have, after we convert that to just be a JSON, we want to actually 
set the user info to be the updated version, right? Because we just called on um, this new API. We got a new person back from it. Now we want to update our state to have the old people plus the new people. So basically, we're using spread operator as we've learned in JavaScript. We're going to do dot 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 user info. It's going to grab everything from the original user info, and we're going to do dot 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 data dot results. We're going to add all the new results to be onto our um, array. Uh, yeah, you might be wondering also what results is. That's also just part of the Axios documentation. So if you ever forget the terminology, um, you can always search it up, but you can do data dot results to grab the actual um, um, actual elements from it. Um, yeah, so we've now added it onto user info. We want to do one last thing. We want to change the page number. So we want to change the page number to be one plus its original form. So we're going to just do page number plus one. Then we want to just um, catch any errors that show up. In our case, we're just printing out the errors. Let's see. So just to be clear, is adding new user info and data result results. It's adding new user info and data dot results to the pre-existing ones. Sorry, um, I meant like so the dot 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 operation that's yeah. like adding the new user info and data dot results to the mm -hmm. pre-existing ones. Yeah, exactly. So um, remember how in state we have. Um, our user info and our set user info. So basically mm -hmm. we're updating, like you said, our previous user info to be what it originally was plus um, the new data that we just got. So I'm pretty sure you, you got the idea. Um, basically we're just updating it to have um, the new data. Oh, so like for like the each user info for like each day having the user info so, and the user info is like the each individual information, basically. Yeah, exactly. So um, each, um, remember how like our user info is like an array of a ton of users in it. So uh -huh. we're just kind of, basically, maybe we have like Bob and John and Robert here. Um, that's our user info and data.results returned us, what's another name? Um, Jane, we're basically going to take, um, oh, I don't like how it loads every time I write something. That's the only thing I don't like about Code Sandbox. But basically, we're just going to be kind of like kind of putting these together, like appending them onto each other um, so that we can get our entire list of user. Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, I see. Sorry, but just to make sure that I understood it correctly, so like the data, is the JSON format of those array. And mm -hmm. then like the user info is the each person like Bob or John or Robert, if I- mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, oh, oh, I see, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, you got that pretty much exactly on point. Um, the reason why we have to change it into JSON is because um, that's just how we can actually um, like access to variables. It's a little bit hard to explain, but we can't like actually um, parse through any of the arrays unless we change it into a JSON um, format. So that's why we have to do all of this part. Okay. I have a really quick question as well. When we do yeah. dot get from the API, like do we get like arrays of information and we change that into the JSON? Um, so we get, an object actually. Um, let me see if there's actually a way I can print this out. Maybe that'll help. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's just do. Uh, let's just take the data. Let's just take the response. And then we can console. Okay, there might be a lot of things. So I'm not sure this will work. But let's see. If Oh, oops. We'll just kind of play around to see if we can get it to show. Let's see. Um, hmm. There were 
well. We'll take a look really quick. Oh, I did get a question though. Um, someone asked if we have to leave early for DSP reasons, is there a way to log on to the attendance form and receive half credit if we make up the rest of the class later? Um, honestly, I don't know the exact um, logistics over it, but um, in my, I, to the best of my knowledge, I think it's okay to leave early. Um, you can go ahead and just like uh, direct message me on Slack and I can give you the, the code afterwards. Um, as long as it's just like a one time thing um, for like yeah, any like uh, unexpected circumstances. Yeah, and I can just solve that um, on my own time. Okay, let's see. Uh, what was I doing again? Let's see. Okay, maybe I have to create a new one because this one, there's a ton of things already here. Let me take a look. Let's, oh boy, I'm just gonna create a new code sandbox really quick. Um, but basically what I'm trying to show to you guys is that um, your actual thing that you receive from your API link is um, not an array, but it's, it's a lot of objects that have a lot of different information in it. Um, but most of the uh -huh. time, the only thing that you actually need to access would be like data. Um, that's why we do dot data on it. Okay, let me see if I can. And the dot data converts it to like a JSON? Uh, yeah, exactly. It converts it into um, uh, a JSON um, automatically because of Axios. Okay, let's see. I believe I believe I could just use vanilla JS. Yeah, and also this would be a good way to show you guys how to use code sandbox, though it is extremely slow. Should we use vanilla JS or should we use like the React for like um, experimenting? Um, I think both would work. The reason why I'm just doing JS is because like, it's just like, I'm only going to write like two lines of code. So I don't. Right, really right. Um, but let's see. Like, I think Fetch and, um, uh, and Axios do the kind of, um, they both return the same objects. So I'm just going to sh um, show you Fetch. Uh, it's fine. My original. Let's pull that here. Okay, and then let's just do like a, hopefully this works. If not, I can also try to stay after to make this work because I'm kind of doing this on the fly. Console.log, it's console.log that responds. Okay, so as you can see, um, it returns a response with a lot of information in it. Um, mm -hmm. I like don't even know what some of these do like blob. I know sometimes you do need to use headers and body. Uh, actually, yeah, like body. Um, the difference is that fetch, fetch, I think you have to use your bot, the body. Um, but, oh, but like um, Axios, you use um, data. So I think that's all the, the also just like a nitpicky kind of difference. But like, this is just to show you like how there's a lot of different things in here and it's not necessarily um, an array, but it's like a whole response object. Does that help to clarify things? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let me go back to one of the school. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I think that was actually pretty close to being done. Um, every time we change the page number to be um, page number plus one, and that's going to um, make sure that upon the next one that we call, it's gonna be a new page um, because um, we're putting in a new page number here and a new number here as well. Yeah, um, I think that's pretty much all I wanna mention here. There's a lot of other small things that I wanna do just to play around with it, but does this all make sense to everyone?
Cool. Okay. So something else that I just wanted to show is um, just like what I was saying before, use the effect. Um, if you were to put an empty and array on it, it would call it like right at the beginning, right? Um, so this is what it originally was. Let's try refreshing it. Oh, actually, no, I broke it earlier. Let me fix this really quick. All right, let's do that. Okay, I think it should work again. Um, let's put this down. Okay, so this is how it originally looked like. Um, but if we were to put in a use effect here, uh, do you see how something appeared right at the start? That's because remember how I said um, it only call it only renders once at the start of it. Um, so basically, right at the start, it's going to call fetch new user, uh, and that's how that's why like one appears right at the start. Uh, that's just something else I want to mention. Um, yeah, and then I also wanted to like hopefully just like play around with this to show how there's like a lot of different ways you can do stuff in um, React. So it's kind of very similarly to our example before with the counter. We can kind of do it kind of similar like that. So instead of putting like fetch new user here, you can do like set page number and then kind of increase that to be number. Oops, I think it should be capitalized. Plus one. Uh, okay, ignore this right now because it kind of renders every time I write something, which is kind of annoying. Um, and then instead of doing that, let me think. Uh, we can also change it so that every time page number is changed, we can call this, uh, which is why it's going crazy right now because we keep changing page number every single time. So let's take that out. Hopefully that'll fix it. Let's refresh. Yeah, so do you see how like this does the exact same thing as we did before? Um, there's just like a different way to do it using like use effect. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of ways to do um, things in React. Um, there's not one specific way. You could use use effect. You could also not use use effect. So yeah, there is also, yeah, another way to do it. Do we have any questions? Okay, if not, let's see, we have like a little bit more than 30 minutes, so I'm going to continue onward. Uh, server side rendering. Okay, so server side rendering, I'm going to go over this really quickly because we, we don't actually have a demo for this. This is more of like, um, okay, I'll answer the question in a bit. Um, basically, what I was saying with server side rendering is um, it's basically, the key idea with it is that there's this framework called next.js um, that's really good with server-side rendering. And the reason why we need server-side rendering is it helps make your code, your website load a lot faster. So after you become a little bit more used to React, you have to start thinking about like, oh, how can we make the code render faster? How do we not make people waste a lot of time, like a lot of milliseconds ramp up and it becomes a lot of time wasted, right? If they are just waiting for everything to load. So instead, server-side rendering kind of first shows all the HTML. None of it actually works, it's just HTML. And then after it visually shows, then the JavaScript um, and React kind of load afterwards. So basically, the reason why I want to do this is because when the first when the first things that the user sees is the HTML, they don't really care if it works yet because they haven't clicked on anything yet. So they can't tell it that it doesn't work. So first they see the HTML load and then they don't freak out that the website's taking forever to, to load, right? But if you have like an original, just like plain React um, and no JS, a lot of times they have to load the HTML, then the JavaScript, then the React. And because of that, it's going to have the users wait a lot of times for everything to run through. Because if you remember, 
React kind of goes through everything first to see if there's any like compilation errors. So it's going to have to go through everything and it's going to take a lot, a lot of um, seconds away from the user, right? So that's basically the key idea of server side rendering. And one way that you can basically do this is with next.js. So don't have a demo for it, but I can just click on it and show you the website a little bit. Um, I think I did have a question though. So someone explained, someone asked, can you explain why there was a picture when we first reloaded the page? Yeah. Let me, oops, wrong one. Okay, so there's um, a picture when we first load the page because um, page number is originally, uh, uh, page number is originally uh, like it's changed, right? It's going to set from one to two to three. It's, it's always changing. So upon like the first one, it's going to original, it's going to already um, like display fetch new user. Uh, if we like, the reason why I didn't show in the first time is because we didn't have use effect here, right? Because we didn't have use effect here, it wouldn't render um, until this was clicked. But because we had use effect here now, it's gonna render use effect anytime any of our code is rendered. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, let me go back to just showing you guys the website a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, kind of doing this impromptu, this part, so. I think a lot of it, because um, we don't have like a demo, it's just kind of exploring the documentation and seeing what works best for you. Um, Next.js is really easy to set up. And just for any of these applications, always look at the documentations. They have all the things you need to know to install it, um, which just, it's as easy as like typing this into your terminal. Then just have to read, there's a little bit of differences in here with how like things are routed and stuff. Um, so that's all just about learning a new language, but it's actually very, very similar to just regular Node.js. So I encourage you just to read this on your own if you have time, but that's just basically the high level overview of why, um, why we need to use server-side rendering. And there, everything I explained in 10 minutes is basically this one sentence, lit. Okay, Redux. Um, so Redux, is also a super high level tool. Um, I think to explain Redux, it's also something that requires a lot of practice. Um, I've never actually had to use it in a personal project before. So I don't know like the super nitpicky things about it, but I know that this is like, it comes up in almost every single team meeting. Um, the reason why we need Redux is because state, eventually becomes very, very, very hard to manage once your application becomes super fat. Um, I did prepare a little Figma diagram, I think, to show kind of why it can become very messy. So because we've been creating like really small applications, we don't need to use Redux um, because there's literally like, there's like five components, like nothing can go wrong with it very much. But just to show you a really quick, um, diagram of how things can go fat, um, can, things can go wrong like pretty fast. I like kind of created this diagram of how your app might look like if you were to create like a, like a Gmail kind of um, application. So your file structure will start with application. Um, it's just your app.js. Then for example, you might need a, you need your login, right? Um, almost all applications have a login. Then they have for our specific application, we want an inbox and we want to be able to search the inbox. Um, even lower than the inbox, what if we wanna show just one specific email in our inbox? That would be a component under inbox. So this is just a really general file structure. Our database, we need to take um, from our backend da database with an API and we, we might think, oh, where do we actually need to use the database? We need to use it in inbox. We need to use it in one email and we need to use it in search inbox. 
we don't need to use in login because login, we don't need to show all of the emails, right? So why do we need to have our database in the login? So basically, do you see the problem when like, this can be passed down to here, no problem. But how is this gonna be passed to here? Like React doesn't allow us to do that. React only allows us to pass through props. But we can't pass through its like sister kind of sibling. So this becomes a problem. One way you might think to solve it is to put the database up here. If you put it up here, then we can pass it down to here. Then we can also pass it down to here. And then also down from, from here, we can pass it down to here. This is a solution, but it is a solution that can go wrong quickly as well. One reason is because why would you need to put the database up an app when the app doesn't use the database? Like we only need it, we only need to use it here, here, and here. Why, why are we putting it here? Another thing that's very similar to that, like let's imagine we have another component down here. Oh, that's my Figma skills aren't that great, but you guys will learn Figma eventually in our course. Um, let's say, let's say, for example, one email is down here and this component doesn't need our database, but this component needs our database, this component needs our database, and this component needs our database. In order to get down to here, we need to pass from here to here to here to here. But then again, this one doesn't need to use the database at all. So as you can see, there's a lot of wasted space, a lot of weird passing down props for no reason, but to get to the other child component. And that's why state can get messy really quickly. So someone asked, is there cost for putting database on the component that does not need it? Um, I believe, I don't know if there's specific memory cost. I can't uh, say that for sure, but I guess just thinking about the logic behind it, like why would you have a, like a function takes in a parameter and it uses that parameter, but we're passing in a parameter that is our database and we're never using that parameter at all. So that's kind of like a waste of a function. Like it's kind of disorganized. It's like, why, why do we have a parameter that we never use? But the only use case of that is to pass it down again, right? Like that's very, very inefficient and it's just kind of bad practice. Um, that's just one thing I can think of. I'm not sure if there's a specific memory cost behind it, but um, I think there, there could be, cause like there's basically a whole database being passed down um, from here to almost every single app and it's not being used without all those apps. Um, but let me show you the alternative, which is Redux. And then hopefully it'll show you how there's a lot of um, space being saved as well as a lot more organized code. Uh, okay, let's see where it is even. Let's make it a ellipse. Okay, so basically what Redux does is puts all the state, oh no, that is quite unfortunate. I want it to go above. Um, let's just put a star here. Okay, you know, this will suffice. That will not suffice. Okay, whatever. I'm not great at Figma. <laughs> let's just put this to the back. There we go. All right. I'm too invested now. I'm going to change this to red. Okay. So we have our database here. And instead of having the database passed down, we can basically fetch from this Redux component. I think the specific term for it is called store. So this is our store and we're gonna fetch from it every single time. And instead of having to pass things down, all we have to do is be like, hey, can we grab state from here? Then we're gonna grab state from here. Or this component might be, hey, I need a state. We're gonna just grab state from here. And instead, we just have one global state manager instead of having to pass things down. So hopefully that explains um, just the general idea of why Redux is very important for large applications. Um, to be completely honest, the reason why, like a lot of the times Redux is brought up in like team meetings and stuff, but never actually implemented 
it's because there's a lot of boilerplate and it's a lot of annoying code to at the beginning. So a lot of people don't like doing it at the beginning and then regret it at the end because um, it gets really complicated quickly. But um, it is a lot of boilerplate, which is kind of annoying. Um, and it's kind of a whole different setup to um, think about. So although I don't have like any like specific experience with it individually, like I kind of just pulled up somebody else's code and hopefully I can just show you like a general idea of how it looks like um, to maybe show you like just in general how it might look like to use Redux. So in general, like they all put it into like a folder, I think that's like best practice. There's things called reducers. Um, these are all things that you'd have to read about and like documentation and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna show you like a really quick like tour. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot of new terminology. That's why a lot of people don't like to do it. But I think for most like company size projects, they end up having to do Redux. But a lot of personal projects, like you can get away with not using Redux. Yeah, so I'm just walking through like different things. Um, yeah, there's things called actions, reducers, like a dispatch. It's a lot of different components. Um, I don't know if there, I was looking for a good graph before, but honestly, all of these graphs are incredibly not it, but <laughs> I think this one is okay. I can just show you like a quick idea of like how it were to work basically. You have like your store and your state. This is basically your UI. It, every time you want something, you want to call to something, you'd have to basically dispatch and grab it from the store. Uh, yeah, it's just a general idea. Um, I don't have like specific demo for it, but I just want you to have like a really high overview of how it works and what you need to do in order to implement it. Uh, let's see. Let's see what else there is here. And if you guys want any of these resources, just like ask me or like DM me on Slack, I can send them over to you. Uh, let's see. So yeah, as you can see, like uh, there's there's some there's a lot of benefits to it. Like it's like extremely testable. Um, it's very easy to find like bugs through it. Um, if you have like so many components with regular React, it's really hard to find where, where your state went wrong. Versus if you have Redux, you know your state had like an issue from the store component because that's the only place where state comes from. So yeah, okay. That's just a general idea of Redux. Does that make sense for like the reason why behind it? Um, though I didn't get too much into the actual code. Hopefully just the reason why it's important makes sense. Okay, and lastly, I have like 20 minutes. I'm gonna get into TypeScript really quickly. So TypeScript is basically putting types into JavaScript. So you might've noticed that in JavaScript, there isn't types. There technically is, but when you wanna set things, everything is a let, right? Or everything is a like a const or a var. Those aren't actually types, They're, those are just, assigning something. But if you have used like other languages before, um, most of the time you might see that they require strings, they require integers, and you can't change the types. So basically what TypeScript is, is putting types into JavaScript. Let's see what else is said in the Notion. It's maintained by Microsoft. Um, The reason why TypeScript is important is because JavaScript, a lot of the times, it will not actually error until runtime. And runtime is when a user is actually using it, right? In TypeScript, it will error during compile time. So you can find out while you're, while you're coding and debugging that there's gonna be an error coming versus if you just have regular JavaScript, you might not even know that there was an error until somebody accidentally 
bombed your entire website up. So as you can see, like with a lot of big scale apps, if you don't have TypeScript, it's really, really hard to debug. Let me kind of show you an example. Um, I believe there should be some under our old TypeScript. So how you can use JavaScript or how you can use TypeScript in JavaScript is basically very similar to what it originally is. All you're going to be doing is doing like colon and specifying what specific type you want it to be. Uh, let's see what else there is. So there's also like other things here. Um, a regular integer is just called a number. If you want things to be put into an array, put them into like the brackets. I believe if you want any, you're actually okay with any type. You can just put any here. It doesn't have to be a string or a number if you don't want it to be. Okay, so someone asked, what are the benefits of using TypeScript again? Uh, let me see if I can find a better example. Uh, maybe I could just write something out really quick to just give you a general idea of why it could be useful. So, for example, if you were to have a function um, that takes in I don't have a specific function in mind, so I'm just going to make this like pseudocode basically, but uh, we'll call this uh, JavaScript function. And it requires a parameter. We'll call this parameter parameter because I'm not creative. We can call on it. And when we call on it, we expect there to be a parameter, right? But if we did not put a parameter inside it, JavaScript wouldn't complain. There would be no squiggly line. There will be no errors that show up until a user actually clicks on something. Then something will go terribly wrong because parameter is undefined, right? So whatever you do with, within here, like parameter, I don't know, whatever you do to parameter, parameter is going to be undefined. There's going to be nothing there. So that can go wrong really quickly because JavaScript never complained because JavaScript's kind of dumb, you know, like TypeScript is just kind of there to like give JavaScript its regular functionality that <laughs> other languages have, like C++ and stuff like that. But um, with TypeScript, if you were to do this, it would complain. It would be like, hey, there's no parameter here. Parameter is not the correct type. So does that kind of explain why TypeScript is um, beneficial. Okay, cool. Uh, let me go back. And as like, just like some personal experience of like TypeScript, um, I would say like most like projects of like, uh, yeah, a lot of projects these days use TypeScript. So I think like right now it might like not seem that important, but it's actually pretty important in large scale apps. Um, anytime you have things you need to like debug and just components interacting with each other, it's very important to have that kind of uh, initial default type that you want for any of these um, parameters. So I would say it's actually, you see it a lot in a lot of, um, applications. Uh, I would say these aren't that important. Um, or I mean, they're important, but you can look at that at your own time. I won't go over them. Um, something else I want to mention is called an interface. So TypeScript, you can create an interface for whatever object you want. So this object is called person, and it has a first name and a last name. So we're going to set person to have to be a person object um, from this interface. And with that, we can do person.firstName and person.lastName. Uh, yeah, does that kind of make sense? Um, 
basically it, you're going to need um, user whatever that's passed into Greeter um, to have both a, a first name and a last name. That's basically what it's saying. Um, and if it wasn't an object, if user was, for example, a number or something, it would complain because it would be like, hey, person passed in with a number, it wasn't a person. So yeah, I think that kind of is a very brief overview. Yeah, any questions? If not, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to go through. Um, and just as a really quick conclusion, today we learned um, use effect, um, Axios, Redux, server side rendering, TypeScript. So there's a lot of new tools kind of just dumped onto you guys today. Um, you won't actually see these used in a lot of really, really small scale apps, but in really big scale apps, if you want to be like a really um, good developer that's like up to like new dates, um, new like tools, uh, these are very common applications seen um, all throughout uh, a lot of projects. So I think it was very, yeah, it's very important that you guys like at least are aware of these tools because a lot of the times they'll be like, hey, it will be like a discussion in which do you want to use TypeScript? Do you want to use Redux? A lot of these conversations will come up in a lot of um, projects that you guys will eventually be doing if you're interested in front end um, engineering uh, whatsoever. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have for today's lecture. I can go ahead and give you guys the attendance form. But if you guys have any questions while I prepare that, just let me know. All right. I sent the form. A magic word. Mm, mm. We'll just call it Axios. I'll spell it down. Okay. Um, yeah, that is all for today. So feel free to go after you guys complete that form. Or if you guys had any questions, um, I can also stay until eight. So yeah. No problem. Let me pause the recording.